I'm looking at what the king is doing, and I'm looking at Jordan, and the king, you know, the, the non-oil wealthy monarchs have an incentive to accelerate reforms because they don't have the wealth to buy off the populations. Look, look what they did in Saudi Arabia. The king, as soon as the, you know, showered the country with 36, I believe, billion dollars, uh, as if already wealthy Saudis didn't need more money. But, you know, Saudi Arabia also has an unemployment problem among its youth. Will that solve that problem? I, I don't think you can buy off people. I think people have an innate desire to be free. And I think people deserve to know that they can look at a country like Morocco and they're going to say, you know, instead of, by the way, Arabs looking at France or, for that matter, India or any other country, not necessarily the United States, they don't have to look much further if it works in Morocco. They can say if, it can, if the king, young king of Morocco has the courage to do this, why doesn't my king have the courage to do the same? And, and, and I'm sure this is going to be very interesting because as these Arab monarchies try to band together in the GC, in the in expanded Gulf Cooperation Council, the question is going to be, when the king of Saudi Arabia sits down with, across the table and says to his counterpart in Morocco and says, you know, one of the prices to have our support is to not set us up for uh, reforms that we're not, we ourselves are not prepared to implement. Well, that's the question I wanted to ask Good you. Good segue. You know, exactly, <laughs> because, uh, you know, we have the invitation from the Gulf Cooperation Council to both Morocco and Jordan. Uh, where do you think that's going? Uh, do you think, you know, d d does Morocco belong there? Uh, what, what, is, what are the trade-offs? What, what will they have to give up? Uh, yeah, there's a lot gain? of, these are all very interesting. I've asked, I asked the Moroccans myself, mm -hmm. do they want to become members in the, of the GCC? And they say, why not? Well, I think you know, it's almost akin to what uh, how Ireland viewed being uh, becoming a member of the European Union. I suspect that they see this as a great economic boom without a great deal of, shall we say, obligation. Mm -hmm. And I think that the obviously the Saudis have their own political reasons to want to expand this into what I call the League of, of Arab Monarchies uh, and, and to have Morocco and Jordan join in. But I think from Morocco's perspective, uh, look, the relationship between the royal families has been very close. Mm -hmm. Saudis vacation uh, in Morocco all the time. The royal families in the, among the GCC members uh, and, the, and the monarchy in Morocco have been extreme. I think they're closer than they are in Jordan, than they are mm -hmm. in Jordan. And so there's this, as, as far as this distance is, I probably have met more ruling leaders from the Gulf in Morocco than I would if I had gone to the Gulf mm -hmm. over the years. Well, what are the benefits of membership? Well, that's a very good question because I don't think it's so much, I don't think that's ever been laid out or has been laid out. If, the, if it is, it's been secret discussions because the fact is, is that a, a member of the GCC, whether it's Bahrain or it's the Emirates or Kuwait or Saudi Arabia, it's a co-op, it's a defense cooperation initiative. I suspect that this has much more to do with Iran mm -hmm. and a divergence of interest with the United States and Saudi Arabia than it has to do with Morocco or Jordan. I think this is a real effort by Saudi Arabia to create a new center of gravity of foreign policy in the Middle East. Do you think it would constrain uh, Morocco with respect to the reforms it's implementing? Uh, would they feel constrained, you know, because Saudi Arabia isn't as pro-reform, and uh, would that be a, you know, a, a requirement? Let me, let me, I think that's probably one of the most fascinating questions that one can ask in all of this. In their private talks, uh, will the king or his advisors, and whoever, by the way, will, will uh, replace this king when he passes on, is that king going to turn around to the king of Morocco and say, um, if you want the billions and billions of dollars from us, then uh, these reforms constitute the type of example that it's not beneficial. And, and yet, I suspect that the train has left the station. Uh, the Saudis are no fools either. They can't possibly call on the king uh, to maintain the respect and admiration of his people if he reverse, reverse course. Uh, and that the very 
idea of the Saudis asking the king to slow down these reforms could not only backfire, but in effect backfire so badly as to very undermine the very purpose of this association in the first place. You seem to be saying that it's kind of a, a, a two-way street. Morocco stands to gain economically, but Saudi Arabia is motivated by its concerns vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Does Morocco share those same concerns? Oh, yes. You know, I don't think most people realize that just probably six months ago, the Moroccan government expelled Iranian diplomats and severed relations with Iran over a plot on the part of uh, Iranian agents to undermine the monarchy. And the relationship, shall we say, is less than ideal uh, between um, Morocco and Iran. Uh, Morocco has always steadfastly stood by the United States uh, on its attitudes towards Iran. And I think that, that um, given uh, the fact that the uh, government in Morocco uncovered this plot, and this was significant. This was not some idle Iranian agent meddling around in, uh, with, with individuals in the country. This was clearly a plot to undermine the monarchy. And uh, I can't go into the details because I only know a little bit and they're pretty confidential. But uh, that uh, more or less destroyed any semblance of a normal relationship between Iran and Morocco, which of course is music to the ears of Saudi Arabia.